Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, the next talk is by Serena McDonald about machine learning in financial markets, pitfalls and solutions. Unfortunately, she couldn't be with us today, but she did pre-record her session. But that unfortunately means that there will be no Q&A session after the, after the talk. In her talk, Serena will cover some common mistakes that ML practitioners make that they don't consider the, the, uh, the specifics of the financial field and also how to fix those mistakes. Uh, we are free to start anytime. Hi everyone, I'm Serena. Thanks so much for coming to my talk. Today I will be talking to you about machine learning and financial markets and I will present some pitfalls as well as some solutions. First, a bit about who I am. I am a senior data scientist at Delphia. We are a fintech company based in Toronto, Canada, and we are building an investment collective that will let you invest in the stock market with your data. I work on combining public opinion and social media data to create investment insights and trading strategies that will benefit the collective. I'm also the diversity and inclusion product lead at ACE, where I work on researching fairness in machine learning and I'm investigating how to incorporate fairness into our product. So what is ACE? Well, ACE is a community of machine learning practitioners and enthusiasts here in Toronto. We are creating a video repository of authors presenting their work over live streams. And we also have socials, again, all online, where community members present their projects or papers they have read. We additionally host workshops where you can learn how to implement cutting edge research in the form of a machine learning product. It's a really great way to stay up to date with the field and make friends. So if you're interested in joining, please let me know. We would love to have you and you can email me at my Gmail, which is on the slide or at serena at ai.science. And if you're interested in learning more about ACE, again, go to ai.science. As for my education, I have an undergraduate degree in mathematics and biology from McGill University and a master's in fluid dynamics from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. On the personal side of things, I love playing soccer. I love cycling around Toronto. I think it's the best way to get around the city in my opinion. And that's even in the winter when we can get a lot of snow here in Canada. So I'd like to share a little bit more about my background and what I've worked on in the past so that you can understand my perspective. I think it's really important to acknowledge that everybody's background is unique. Everybody's take on problems is unique, unique as well as a result, which is great. In particular, I have a background in math and biology through my education and finance through my internships, current work, as well as personal interest. Now, interestingly, fluid dynamics and oceanography, they do relate to finance as well, as I realized during my master's, but that's the subject of another talk, and you can email me if you're interested in hearing more. Finally, I have experience with recommender systems, as in a previous role, I built and deployed my company's first recommender system, and I do recommender systems research outside of work as well. Okay, so let's start off by answering an important question. What is AI? I'm sure many of you have your ideas on what AI is, but I do have my own unique perspective. So first, let's see what the internet says. So when I was first starting out as a data scientist, I wanted to know what the hype around AI was all about. So I spent a lot of time Googling. I think it's a pretty natural or reasonable place to start. So Google says that AI is intelligence demonstrated by machines in contrast to natural intelligence demonstrated by humans. This is a fine definition, but I disagree with its widespread usage. I disagree on the basis that this definition doesn't take into account what AI is at the core, and that's just machine learning. And to get even more atomic, that's just math. AI is just math. And I find it a lot less scary when it's described this way. I would rather AI be defined as the application of mathematical models to perform tasks previously believed to be accessible to humans, but maybe that's a bit long-winded. And maybe my reformulation is the same as Wikipedia's definition, but I really just think it's worth highlighting that AI is just math. It's accessible. 
You can learn AI methods if you work hard. So while I prefer to use terms like machine learning rather than AI, I accept that this term is becoming more and more widespread. But please don't be deterred by it or put these met methods on a pedestal equivalently. However, in the spirit of staying topical and using terms that everybody is used to hearing and enjoys using, I will use the term AI throughout my presentation. Okay, so now that I've had a few minutes to explain my views on the term AI, let's talk about what AI can do because there are certainly some interesting use cases. So one fairly recent development in natural language processing is the development of transformers which at a high level is a language model that models the interdependencies between words and sentences. Now, training this sort of model on a large text corpus, it yields some pretty interesting results. For example, you can use models like transformers for language generation. Now, given a prompt such as this example here, you can create a paragraph that might be very close to what a human would actually say. So here's the prompt I gave it. I gave it thank you to the Data Science Conference Europe for inviting me to speak. And then I have done some language generation by using this cool tool called Talk to Transformer. And apparently I go on to advertise my machine learning blog. So I say, want to know how to advert, or sorry, want to know how to apply some of these ideas to real world problems. Read some of my posts about machine learning for data science and machine learning for data engineering. So that's not bad. It's pretty coherent and definitely something I could say. By the way, I do have a blog. Uh, it's serena.mcdonald.ca. Feel free to take a look. Anyways, this is pretty great. So if machine learning is able to generate coherent text, naturally a question might be, maybe a bit of a stretch, but a question might be to ask if machine learning can be used to predict the stock market. Language is hard. Stocks are hard too, so why not jump from one domain to another? But this is a bit idealistic and brings us to the focus of the talk today. So essentially, I'll be talking to you about why domain knowledge is important. So, excuse me. So when tackling a problem using machine learning, it's important to be mindful of the domain in which the problem lies. In the talk today, I will outline three problems that might occur if you try to blindly apply machine learning to financial markets without taking special consideration of the idiosyncrasies of the field. And I'll outline each problem using the framing of what a machine learning practitioner might be tempted to do, why they might run into a problem doing this, and what they should consider doing instead. And I'll use examples inspired by previous experiences at work and in my own personal um, exploration of this field. And please, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Again, my email is smmcdonald.gmail.com. Okay, so the first problem in financial markets is that the past does not equal the future. So of course, this might seem obvious, but please hear me out. In machine learning, the past is often indicative of the future. So let's take the computer vision standpoint for this example. A dog will always be a dog. And this is my dog, by the way. She is quite cute. <laughs> so a computer vision practitioner, let's say they have a highly accurate model that can classify dogs from fish. And they can be quite happy with their work. Dogs aren't going to morph into dog-fish hybrids anytime in the near future. So they can be confident that their model is a good one. But what happens in the training data, that's not indicative of what will happen in the future. Truly the past in a sense, it really doesn't equal the future. Not in financial markets that is. Could be in the case of with dogs and fish, but not in finance. So the problem in taking this approach in financial markets is that the past truly does not equal the future. What happened last week, that might not help you predict what will happen next week. You have to be aware of these events or the possibility of these events called black swan events. These are events that come as a major surprise and couldn't have been predicted. And there are, are a lot of unknowns in financial markets. So a model that's trained perfectly to fit your in-sample data or your training data, that doesn't mean that your model will generalize to what will happen in the future. And even if your model fits well to your out-of-sample test data, 
That doesn't mean it'll predict future stock price movements. So let's use Tesla as an example. So in around February 2020, the stock price of Tesla experienced a huge run up, which you might recall. And let's specifically consider this time series of Tesla stock from about February 2015 to about five months prior to February 2020. So a reasonable forecasting approach might be to extrapolate the past time series from February 2015 up until February 2020. So let's see what this might look like. So looks like it fits pretty well. Again, let's take a look at what this forecast looks like. Okay, but in reality, here's what happened. The stock went up 5.5 times or so in five months leading up to February 2020. So what happened in Tesla's past from February 2015, it wasn't indicative of what happened in February 2020. So how do you solve this? What is a machine learning practitioner to do? Well, I do have a perspective that I think could help. First, consider using a general model, like a linear one. It's often better to use a simpler model as it's much more generalizable and more robust to these black swan events that might occur. So try to fight the urge to use deep learning and consider Occam's razor, which states that the simplest solution is often the best solution. Now, another approach that you can consider is to simulate your data. So rather than testing on real data, the idea would be to project synthetic paths or paths, I should say, into the future to represent all possible versions of the future. The idea then would be to choose a model that best generalizes across these possible paths. And I would think it would be a linear one that would generalize the best. And another approach is don't take your backtest results so seriously. A backtest, by the way, that's just seeing how well a strategy or model would have done on historical data. And I think this is a good model for life, not just financial markets, just take things with a grain of salt. Okay, so that's the first point. The past does not equal the future. Now on to the next. So let's continue with our example of a computer vision practitioner who has developed a model that classifies dogs from fish. Let's say they've achieved 99% accuracy with their desired accuracy metrics. So check, check, their model's great. So they might be tempted to dust their hands off and call it a day and say, awesome, my model is great. But of course, there's always going to be issues of model drift, but that's besides the point here. So the computer vision scientist, when presented with a stock market prediction problem, they might think that once they have developed a model that predicts the stock market accurately, then they might think they're done. But that's actually not enough. So even if you could perfectly predict this, where, where stock prices are going to go, there are important parameters that you need to determine beyond this. For example, you need to determine how often you will buy and sell. And you need to determine, is your strategy long only? That is, you bet on stock prices increasing, or, or will you incorporate shorting? That is, you bet on stock prices decreasing. And speaking of stock prices and money in general, what is your bet size going to be? You need to consider that. And how much do you want to buy or sell each trade? How long will you hold for? How many stocks are you going to have in your portfolio? And changing even the value of one of these parameters that can change the outcome, outcome of your trading strategy. And it can be the difference between losing a lot of money or making a lot of money. And in financial markets, you, of course, don't want to be on the losing end. So you can consider a trading strategy as being built up of two parts. So first there is the signal model. So that is some sort of machine learning model. It doesn't necessarily have to be machine learning, but something that will predict the movements of the stock market. So for example, let's say a signal might be that we've noticed every time Elon Musk tweets something that has a positive sentiment, Tesla stock goes up. So we might develop a machine learning model to label the sentiment of Elon Musk tweets. And we would continuously run his tweets through our model in order to determine if there's a strong signal or a strong indication that Tesla stock will go up. So we have our signal. The next part of the trading strategy problem is to develop what we call, or what I call, a strategy model. So the strategy model looks at how we might take the signal and translate it into actions. And we can investigate various strategies, or strategy parameters, I should say, that is looking into how often we trade 
how much money we use each time we trade, how long we hold our positions for, really, the number of stocks in our portfolio, are we long or are we short, etc. So really the problem here is that if you come from a traditional machine learning background, that is a background that is not financial markets, you might think your model or what your job is done once your model is done. And that is once your signal model is done. In reality, that only equates to solving half of the problem. So there's an additional step beyond just building a machine learning model. Okay, so that was the second point that perfect accuracy is not enough. Next point is that memory is important. So this is inspired by a book called The Advances in Financial Machine Learning by Marco Lopez Prado. Lopez Prado is a well-regarded figure in the field of financial mathematics. And I encourage you, if you're interested, to read this book. You'll learn much more about pitfalls and solutions in using machine learning in financial markets. Okay, so we are going to go over a quick primer on time series. Stock market prices, they are time series. So that is every stock price is presented with a point in time in which this price occurred. So stock prices are made up of a price and a timestamp pair. So we need to talk about what a stationary time series is. A stationary time series is one whose distribution does not change over time. So its mean and variance are the same regardless of the point in time that you're considering. And many time series models, they assume that data is stationary. And this is because time series assume that the underlying generation data process remains constant throughout time. So all, all models, they have assumptions and stationarity is an assumption for many of these time series models. So given that stock prices are a time series and we need to have a stationary time series in order to use these standard machine learning and time series models, we can do what's called differencing. So differencing is a way in which you, you compute the difference between consecutive observations. And specifically, this is called integer differencing. In the resulting time series, the difference one is stationary. Now, another concept is memory. You can think of a time series as having memory when its past values are related to its future values, that is, it has a trend. Put this another way, a time series has memory if its previous time steps are predictive of its future values. So these are three concepts to keep in mind. So stationary time series, differencing, and memory. So again, as mentioned, stock price is a time series and it might not necessarily or often really is not stationary. So one of the first things that a well-trained data scientist or machine learning practitioner will do when presented with a time series is difference it to make it stationary. And this is well regarded to be one of the first steps to take. And it makes sense because as mentioned, every model comes with its own assumptions. So time series models such as REMA, so autoregressive integrated moving average, they assume that the data you're working with will be stationary. So you need to make it stationary. And again, to reiterate, stationarity means that the distribution of a time series does not change over time. So its mean and variance don't change. So taking a look at the time series on the left of the slide, it's non-stationary so that the mean from time step zero to 20 is about negative 0.1 and the mean from time step 40 to 60 is about 0.2. So as mentioned, we can integer difference the time series by subtracting the previous time step value from the current time step value throughout the entire time series. And this results in the plot on the right so you can see that the mean stays about the same throughout time. And this is great. So then given a stationary time series or a, a non-stationary time series that has been transformed into a stationary one using differencing, we can apply some sort of model like NARIMA and we'll be well on our way to predicting stock prices, but not so fast. There's a bit of a problem in this approach. By differencing a time series, we are effectively removing any memory. So we're removing any predictive power and or any information in the time series that might have predictive power. So that's why the title of the section is called Memory is Important because it really is. So on the left in the non-stationary time series, if we were to extrapolate the time series from time step 20 to 30, we could make a fairly good prediction of what will happen at time step 40. And this is because this non-stationary time series, it has memory. But on the right, if we try to 
extrapolate the time series from time step 20 to 30 and predict what will happen at time step 40. Well, it's a bit random looking and a bit difficult. And this is because we've inadvertently stripped out any memory from our time series by doing differencing. So the problem with differencing really is as follows. So first, let's consider that the efficient market hypothesis holds. So that is anything that could affect stock prices has already been priced into the market and markets as a result cannot be beat. Put this another way, this means that markets can't be predicted. Now, when we have stock prices and we difference our time series using integer differencing, we remove any memory. So past prices cannot be effectively related to future prices. So what we're doing then is creating an environment where the efficient market hypothesis essentially holds by construction. The hypothesis states that markets can't be predicted, but we're doing integer differencing of our time series so much that markets can't be predicted. So it's a bit of a strange situation. So then what is a well-trained data scientist to do? If we're stripping away useful memory from stock data by doing integer differencing, but we need stationary data in order to use our models, so what solution is out there? Well, I keep on mentioning integer differencing, and I'm being very specific about, about saying integer differencing. And again, that's when you take the value of your time series today and subtract yesterday's value, and you do that for every single day in your time series. So the solution here to retain memory is to use something called fractional differencing. So not integer differencing, but fractional differencing. The math is a little complicated, but at a high level, the distinction is as follows. So in integer differencing, you compute the difference between timestamps, and that timestamp will be an integer. So for example, if you want to do first order differencing, you can compute the difference between the current time step and the previous time step. Second order differencing would mean you compute the difference between the current time step and two time steps ago. For fractional differencing, you don't subtract values that are an integer value apart to be a bit, a bit more concrete. Instead of subtracting yesterday's value, you would subtract something that is a bit smaller than yesterday's value. What you end up getting is a time series that is stationary according to statistical tests you might use to test for stationarity, but you still retain a bit of memory. So you still have a bit of this predictive power in the time series. So you can see an example of a fractionally different time series on the right-hand side of this slide. So this is the same non-stationary time series that we transformed into a stationary one that didn't have memory two slides ago. And now we've transformed it using fractional differencing and retained some memory. As you can see, we can still capture this large peak and drop around time step 80 in the stationary series on the right-hand side. So we've retained some memory. And when you do a statistical test called the augmented Dickey Fuller test, you can see that this time series is in fact stationary. So at this point, a well-trained data scientist can be happy and go on to use their favorite time series models such as ARIMAs. Okay, so really, the important thing to remember is that domain knowledge is important. When using machine learning for stock market prediction, it might seem very easy. You just can create your model and hopefully it does, it performs well and there you go. Well, it's actually not that easy. The problem has three parts. So the past is not equal to future. Perfect accuracy is not enough. And then finally, when dealing with stationarity and memory, it's a trade-off. So I want to say thank you so much to Data Science Conference Europe for inviting me to speak.